Okay, well, I get, a, I get to start us off this evening. Um, again, my name is Melissa Liu, and I am the chairperson of the Como Community Council. If you don't know, every city in every St. Paul neighborhood has its own district council, and here in Como, that's us. We're an independent nonprofit that represents District 10, which is one of St. Paul's 17 planning districts. Um, you can see our map here of our area in St. Paul. This is the remote version of our annual report. Normally, for those of you who have ever had a toddler, when they learn to open doors, life gets very different. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the remote version of our annual report. Normally, we hold our annual meeting in April. And this year, due to the coronavirus pandemic, that made our annual meeting in person impossible. Like many of you, we're doing things in different ways and trying to fit into this new normal. And along the way, we found some really unexpected opportunities. And our elections that we're hosting tonight is another great example of that. Previously in District 10, you had to vote in person. Now, because of the pandemic, those restrictions make it impossible. So as a board, we um, changed our bylaws and now community members can vote absentee. The response has been phenomenal. Previously in a good year, we might get 125 people to show up to vote. However, this year we've had more than 425 people request a ballot. So we wanna thank you, our neighbors, for your patience, um, for your flexibility, and also your willingness to make us a more responsive organization. And after this, we're gonna have um, Marika. She's the secretary of District 10. She's gonna speak next. So I'm Marika Sela. I'm the secretary of District 10. Built into our DNA is that we are open, transparent, and accessible to anyone who lives in District 10. Our bylaws, which are the rules that govern how we operate, guarantee that. We do most of our work through three committees, environment, land use, and the neighborhood relations. Our committees meet every month, and these committees exercise democracy in its best form. What that means is that every community member can attend, speak, and vote at any of our committee meetings. We give notice about when the committees meet and we give as much notice as possible about what the committees plan to talk about. Committee work is the way that we connect people and combine your ideas and passion and power. We give you an organized, constructive, ongoing way to get things done. Board members are volunteers who are elected by you, our neighbors. We are accountable to you. The board, like our committees, meets every month. Board meetings are open to every community member, and we set aside a section at every meeting exclusively so community members can raise what's on their minds. We work hard to make our committee and board meetings a trusted space to talk and listen. And that's not just lip service. Since our 2019 annual meeting, in-person meeting attendance was over 1,000 attendees. As neighbors, we may not always agree on the best path, but being a receptive neighborhood means being open-minded to our diversity, uh, our diversity of residents, experiences, our opinions, and our priorities. By talking with each other, we have a better chance of finding common ground and making decisions that represent the full range of those who live here. And I'll turn it over to Michael. So hi, I'm Michael Kukta. I'm the Executive Director of the District Council. We fundamentally believe that a better informed neighborhood makes better decisions. And that's why we host annual Q&A sessions with our commissioner and our city council members. We host other city officials so you can get firsthand information about new policies. Before last November's trash referendum, we published a no-spin version of what was and what was not at stake. We made sure Como residents had a chance to weigh in when the city was studying whether or not to charge for parking at the zoo and conservatory. We put a lot of effort into communicating with the Como neighborhood. We try to be a reliable source of truthful, factual information. Every Friday, we send out an email newsletter about what's going on in Como and the city. If you don't get the newsletter, you can sign up on our website or just read it there. Yes, we do maintain a robust website. 
it's a little outdated in how it looks and works, but it's loaded with current, archival, and just plain useful information. We also submit articles every month to the Como Midway Monitor and the Park Bugle. Those are the free community newspapers that show up at your home. We hope you use one or all of these options to stay informed and stay ahead of the curve. And now Mike Ireland, the treasurer. Thank you, Michael. As Melissa said earlier, we are an independent nonprofit organization. We are not part of the city or county government. However, most of our funding does come from grants from St. Paul. My name is Mike Ireland. I'm the treasurer of our council and I'm going to give you a brief overview of our finances. Our main funding source is the community engagement grant. It's about $64,000 a year and it's dedicated to community engagement. It pays for all of our day-to-day -day activities, staff salaries, office, office expenses, and the other initiatives that help us build a stronger community. Examples of uh, what we use that funding for include our educational Sunday series, the crime prevention and block club resources, social events like Como Fest, and we, a welcome book offered to people moving into our neighborhood. And also we mailed the postcards inviting every resident to uh, invite in our vote in our elections. The other major financial source, about $6,000 a year is from the city's innovation grant. We use this money to try new things. Led by Emily Rodriguez, our community organizer, organizer who we also share with uh, St. Anthony District Council. These new efforts include hosting meet and greets at apartment communities to introduce ourselves to renters and better understand uh, their concerns and priorities. We partnered with other district councils and council member J Mitra Jolly to hold Ward Ford Renters Summit. We heard from one of the nation's leading experts on rent control and its alternatives. We also heard from the St. Paul Fair Housing Coordinator who uh, gave us an early look at the city's proposed tenant protection ordinance and safe housing initiative. We laid the groundwork for a youth summit among the six high school programs in our neighborhood. And we had storytellers from different cultures come to family events as well. We partner partnered with the North End District Council for strategic communication training and uh, also workshops that explored the difference between uh, simple outreach and authentic community engagement. We um, also get funding from various other sources, including the citywide drop-off event and the Capital Region Watershed District Grant. And these two are important sources of financial uh, uh, funding that's targeted to specific events that you're going to hear a bit later. Uh, the last resource I want to highlight is in many ways uh, the most essential. It's individual donations. Now, people financially give to our council through various means, such as the employer matching programs, uh, give to the max day and cash contributions as well uh, that are, we offer at our free, free community events. Uh, those financial donations are important, but donations, uh, monetary donations don't have to be financial to really have a substantial impact. One of the most valuable ways people give is of their time and their effort. Without this incredibly crucial source of giving, we would not, we, we could not exist as we do today. And we're humbly grateful for the invaluable, meaningful way our community members donate uh, to this council and give to our community. Financially, uh, we benefit from the work and the foresight of our previous boards who really left us in a strong financial position. Adding up the cash that we have on hand and what the city owes us in reimbursements, we have a balance of about $64,000 and that's eight months worth of operating expenses. The economic crash that accompanied the pandemic decimated city revenue. And along with our reserves in the near future, we're gonna to need to quite possibly rely on direct donations from businesses, other organizations and you so that we can continue the vital work we do for you and for our community. And now I turn it over to Jennifer Victor Larson. Thank you, Mike. I'm uh, Jennifer Victor Larson. I am a board member on the Environment Committee. 
Uh, our committee has a proud history of making change in the city. It was members of this committee that created the Capital Region Watershed District, which has done immense work on improving the water quality in Como Lake and in beautifying the neighborhood at the same time. Uh, and members of this committee created the Como Woodland Outdoor Classroom, which a lot of us enjoy, a nature preserve and education site within the park that includes eight distinct native plant communities and 27 interpretive sites. This year, our committee added to that legacy and we oversaw the Como Pathways Project, uh, a work group of community volunteers spent months surveying users of Como Park. And the result was a comprehensive report on how to improve the quality and usefulness of the park's walking and bicycle paths. Their research amazingly included 573 surveys uh, given all that neighborhood wisdom, it's no surprise that when um, the recommendations went to the city's Parks and Rec Commission, a longtime commissioner called it one of the finest reports the commission had ever seen or is likely to see. Uh, already Parks and Rec staff are working on our pathways ideas into their construction projects. Uh, and so expect to see more of our influence when the city rebuilds the pavilion and golf course parking lot. In the past year, the Environment Committee also oversaw another year-long project, a bird survey by neighborhood volunteers. The happy result was that we are seeing more birds and more bird species at the lake and woodland than we saw a dozen years ago. The committee also organized Como Lake cleanups in which 63 neighbors uh, went out on the water or walked the shoreline to pull trash from the lake. Uh, this summer, to maintain social distancing, we're setting up a do-it-yourself kind of kit so you can do the same thing on your own schedule. Uh, among other projects we take to protect Como Lake, we are one of six district councils that entered a friendly challenge to see which neighborhood could adopt the most storm drains. Needless to say, Como residents stepped up big time and crushed the competition. It's not all neighborhood activism either. We organized the annual drop-off at the state fairgrounds, which is the largest of the city's four drop-offs. We've partnered with the Como Community Seed Library and Ramsey County Master Gardeners on some other, uh, their creative projects. We've had presentations from the state on how it intends to build more electric vehicle infrastructure. We presented a documentary on the impact of climate change in Minnesota. We learned about implementing the city's climate action plan. And just this month, we talked with Como residents active in St. Paul 350 and about how we could work with them to fight climate change starting where we live. So we're always working on more ways to keep uh, more stuff out of the waste stream too. We've had presentations from Zero Waste St. Paul and a successful Sunday series to help you decide whether what you're cleaning out of your house is trash or treasure. And last but not least, we continue to partner with Ramsey County on the 24-7 Organics Recycling site on Belula, uh, <laughs> Belula Lane. And uh, during much of this year, it is uh, the, the most sex successful food scraps collection project in the county, as many of us uh, well know it. <laughs> Thank you. And that's um, over to Maggie Zimmerman. Hi there, um, my name is Maggie Zimmerman. I'm the chair of the Land Use Committee. So land use handles some of the neighborhood's most routine issues, uh, such as when a resident needs a variance so they can build a garage closer to the property line than zoning allows. We oversee business licenses, which means we give neighbors and business owners a chance to talk with each other, learn about plans and expectations, and if necessary, put limits on how a business can operate in the neighborhood. We're often the first place the neighborhood learns about development projects and road projects. We give the neighbors a chance to raise questions, express concerns, make suggestions, and pay attention to the small details that can make a really big difference in the final result. Using that knowledge, we leverage the city's zoning and site review procedures. That gives us the power to modify the impact of development on our neighborhood. With that, land use also handles many of the neighborhood's most contentious issues. In the last year, the most painful was the conclusion of the bitter dispute between the Twin Cities German Immersion School and local preservationists who wanted historic designation for the former St. Andrews Church building. 
For over a year, land use held public meetings about the school's construction plans and the historic designation efforts. Hundreds of people attended these meetings and behind the scenes, District 10 board members and staff met with representatives from both sides in small groups as individuals through the phone and email conversations. We attempted more formal mediation, but as two separate professional mediators eventually discovered, the needs of the two sides were ultimately incompatible. The two sides ultimately fought politically and in court. Land use continued to pay attention to the impact of the school's success had and continues to have on things like traffic congestion, parking, pedestrian safety, and playground noise. So when the city's planning commission took action that would have allowed school construction in violation of a city zoning code, the district council successfully challenged their decision through an appeal to the city council. The result creates in writing a commitment that means city departments, the school and the district council can't ignore the persistent issues going forward. Uh, more recently, land use uh, has been focusing on two other kind of long running issues. One of them is the former Shalom Home property uh, at 1554 Midway Parkway and the ongoing and ever present impact of the State Fair. As many of you know, uh, the former Shalom Home has been vacant for more than a decade and continues to be a neighborhood eyesore. Now a developer hopes to create 150 market rate apartments in the existing building. The plan, however, requires financial, or I'm sorry, requires substantial parking and density variances. Land use held four meetings with dozens and dozens of nearby neighbors to hash out a viable and acceptable solution. With a lot of work and the neighbors' support, uh, we supported the developer's variance. Our recommendation stunned the city zoning board. One member said he could not remember a neighborhood supporting a parking variance of that magnitude. But we feel like that's what happens when you actually talk with and listen to your neighbors to find a solution. We've also been talking with neighbors for years about the impact of the state fair and other fairground events. We're working through a long and ever-growing list of challenges. This past year, we focused on three. That was parking enforcement, peddler enforcement, and public safety. We are at the table with more than a half a dozen city departments and have seen substantial changes because of our involvement. Our cheat sheet is what is and is not allowed on the streets and sidewalks and lawns outside the fairgrounds is the handbook that the city inspectors and residents rely on now. If that's not enough, uh, we're now looking into whether to allow lawn parking during the annual Back to the 50s event at the state fairgrounds. There's always something going on at land use, so stay tuned. Next up is Sarah Reiter from Neighborhood Relations. Okay, hi, I'm Sarah Ryder. I'm Chair of Neighborhood Relations. Um, our committee mixes serious fun with serious work. For fun, we organize our annual Ice Cream Social, which is a simple family event in which more than 500 neighbors chill out in the park for a few hours. In 2019, we added Como Connect to the mix, and that gave two dozen neighborhood organizations a chance to connect face-to-face -face with Como residents. Because of the pandemic, we've unfortunately had to cancel the ice cream social for this July, but we still hope to have a similar event in fall, maybe some donuts and cider. The pandemic also gave us a reason to try to energize our block clubs, provide resources for our neighbors to look out for each other during quarantine and connect neighbors with seniors in our retirement communities who are more isolated these days than ever. Most visibly, we organized a contest among local artists that resulted in the Como Kindness lawn, lawn signs. We've sold out two printings and as residents use the signs to spread a positive message in these tumultuous times. On a more serious side, last fall, after a couple of high profile assaults around the lake, our committee organized a safety walk. Along the way, we collected observations and ideas of how better lighting, landscaping, and other features could make the paths safer. The police department's crime prevention specialist combined our suggestions with her own observations and created a formal crime prevention through environmental design report. We've submitted that report for funding through the city's capital improvement board. The last few weeks have been a blur and in the wake of the killing of George Floyd by Minneapolis police and the civic uprising that followed, as an immediate response, we organized food drives to meet the immediate needs of residents cut off from the cut off from grocery stores. 
Como residents were amazingly generous. We also collected activity supplies for children directly affected by rioting. We were also collecting household goods for residents of the Booth Brown House in our neighborhood who are transitioning out of homelessness. In the near future, we expect to set up something more permanent and sustainable. Most importantly, at our June meeting, we started a wide ranging conversation about recognizing and undoing the racism and marginalization that are twisted into so much of the structure of the Twin Cities. That conversation included looking at how we as a district council need to change and how we as a neighborhood need to change. This is Michael. The killing of George Floyd shows how far we have to go to live up to the truths that are supposed to be self-evident. As leaders of an organization that too often prioritizes the preferences of the privilege, we have much to learn and much to change. We know the work of creating a just society is far from done. But justice won't come unless people like us, organization like ours, and neighborhoods such as Como help force changes that eliminate the built-in institutional racism under which some suffer while many of us benefit. We like to tell ourselves that the core of our work as a district council is improving life where we live. But those words are empty unless we act. To act effectively, we who lead this organization have to understand the lives of people of color, of quote unquote essential workers, and of other neighbors whose day-to-day -day realities we now fail to grasp. And as we conclude this portion of our annual report, I just want to invite everyone in our neighborhood to please reach out to us through our online survey um, with your suggestions on how together we can act to dismantle inequity and to do work that actually reflects the true richness of our community, create a neighborhood that is demonstrably welcoming for everyone. So we intend to listen to you, we intend to learn from you and work arm in arm with you. When we come together, we're indeed stronger together. So thank you for the chairs of various committees and the officers for the annual report.